Folks, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we are streaming live, so I want to start today's program on time. I'm Steve Clements. I direct the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. I'm very pleased to have an old friend uh, of mine from, from way, way back in the 1990s when I was just getting into the think tank business uh, here in Washington, Jeff Gedman. Uh, Jeff, as you know, is president of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. Uh, he is, uh, prior to joining uh, Radio Free Europe, he was director of the Aspen Institute in Berlin and a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he built and founded uh, the New Atlantic Initiative, uh, which I, I really wish um, was still around. Maybe it still is around, but I haven't, I think, in Jeff's absence and in, in also the absence of the uh, uh, Radek Sikorsky, who's now foreign minister of, of Poland, uh, and, and succeeded Jeff there. The Transatlantic Initiative was one of the few places that really did grab just about every uh, political dimension, every framework and portal into thinking about foreign policy and sort of applied us to uh, think about the compelling big picture questions in, in U.S. foreign policy. We, uh, Jeff publishes everywhere and he travels lots of places and he has a tough job. His job in a way is to uh, both get his people to write and provide a portal for all of us about what's happening in some very tough neighborhoods in the world and also to, I think, stimulate a discussion about what democracy really means and what kind of values and trying to find moments of, uh, uh, of interaction where we can think about how other societies are put together and what we need to know, but also uh, what can be transmitted uh, abroad. And I admire him greatly and his team. And I want us to uh, welcome Jeff Gedman, President of Radio Free Europe, and look forward to a very active discussion titled AFPAC Diary Notes from Islamabad and Kabul. Please welcome Jeff Gedman. Uh, Steve, thank you very much. I uh, uh, confess at the top of the, the program here, and thank you all for being here, that uh, I am here and have the opportunity to chat with you in the next hour. Uh, because of my professional friendship with Steve Clemens. Not because I'm an Afghan or Pakistan expert, actually. And he was kind to, to invite me here as an opinionated generalist and as someone who operates a media company that has broadcasts and operations in Afghanistan and Pakistan and because I just visited and wrote a couple pieces, one for world affairs, one for foreign policy, and Steve and I, as usual, have, has, we have had a very good engagement about some of those issues. So Steve, thank you for having me here. What, what I'd like to do uh, uh, briefly, really, is uh, tell you a little bit about what I did in these two countries, tell you why I went, and of course you're here to hear my impressions and uh, uh, have a nice exchange in the, the discussion round. What I did for me, was really riveting. Uh, uh, I had several dozen meetings with uh, religious leaders, with tribal leaders, uh, with governors, with parliamentarians, with diplomats, Americans and Europeans, uh, NGO activists, of course, military in both countries, of course. Uh, I did not meet uh, with General McChrystal. Uh, I did meet with one of his colleagues, uh, General Mike Bora, uh, and others in the U.S. military, but Mike Bora, uh, who has become a professional friend and who has the uh, uh, immense challenge, but the very gratifying task of training the Afghan Air Force. Uh, I did meet with President Karzai and had an hour private with him. Um, and I want to share something about that. But let me tell you a word about why I went. As Steve said, I'm the president of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. This was the institution that many people know from the Cold War that broadcast the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. And in the last 20 years, it's remade itself. Uh, we are congressionally funded. Uh, we are overseen by a board called the Broadcast Board of Governors, which is appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. It's bipartisan. Uh, we're part of a family of US, U.S. international broadcasters that includes Voice of America and Middle East Broadcast Network, Radio Free Asia, uh, Radio and Television Marti. We do something that, that we call surrogate broadcasting. It's exactly what we did in the Cold War, by the way, surrogate broadcasting. That is not to, uh, to borrow a phrase, tell America's story or illuminate American foreign policies or shed light on American culture or society, which is so worthy and important. But our principal and primary focus is to provide domestic news, 
information, culture, literature, domestic, on domestic terms for countries that either do not have free media because their governments deny them, or countries in transition, countries that are uh, still not to the point where they have their own reliable, mature, independent, free, and professional media. We're broadcasting in 28 languages from Russia to the Middle East. We use radio, we use some television, we use a lot of internet, we use all the social media and YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. We don't do propaganda. This is accurate, reliable, independent journalism. We don't do propaganda. And Steve was kind enough to mention it is challenging. And I have to say I would be remiss if I didn't say that these particular weeks, Steve, um, we're preoccupied with the terrible violence in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, 2,000 dead, 400,000 displaced, 2,000 dead in Kyrgyzstan. And for us as a company, it affects us in a very direct sort of way. Uh, I have a colleague in uh, Kyrgyzstan, one of our reporters, whose brother went to Jalalabad last week on business, uh, got caught, caught up in the wrong place at the wrong time and was murdered by an Uzbek gang. Uh, I've got another colleague in Prague whose wife uh, two weeks ago was unfortunately caught up in this in visiting Osh, and fortunately we just got her out, but spent the better part of two weeks hiding in a basement with gunfire outside. So if I may say and tip my hat to our journalists, they're very brave and they do remarkable work under very difficult circumstances. And of course that's why I went to Pakistan and that's why I went to Afghanistan to meet with all these uh, representatives of society and of the military and religious and tribal leaders, but to inspect and visit and learn more about our operations there. In Pakistan, uh, we have a bureau and it's new. We have a station and it's new. We've joined Voice of America that has been there and does terrific work. And uh, as we are elsewhere, we're locally branded in each and every place. We operate something now called Radio Mashal. That means torch. Radio Mashal, which concentrates on the Pashtun border regions. Um, by the way, Steve, I noticed in doing a little homework for the talk that you invited me to give today that you kindly published very recently an article by our bureau chief, uh, Rahil Khan, on the battle for Pakistan and particular problems with the insurgency in that country. Uh, we have this presence. It's new in Pakistan. I'll tell you more about that later. We also have a presence which is really full blossom in Afghanistan. Uh, we're locally branded there as Radio Azadi, which means in Dari, uh, Radio Liberty. We broadcast in both prominent languages of the country, Dari and Pashto. We have 50% of audience size in the country, if I may say. I'm, I'm bragging a little bit, but we have tremendous uh, success. We have a bureau in Kabul. We have reporters that cover all 34 provinces in Afghanistan. And as I like to say, Steve, uh, our reporters are reporting, and they're journalists, and they're working for a media company. But uh, our reporters are having a kind of, I don't know if you call it a dance or a kind of love affair with the Afghan people. Uh, we get every week hundreds of letters, bags of letters from Afghan li listeners uh, responding to all sorts of programming we do. We do programming on culture. We do programming on literature. We do programming on health care, women's issues, economy, corruption, politics. If, uh, if someone is in a village and something's broken and no one's fixing it, they call Radio Azadi and say, who can, we, we want accountable government. Who can answer this? We had a call recently uh, from a, a man who said, uh, I trust your station. My wife has left me. Can you get her back? We didn't turn that trick uh, yet. I was in a, a meeting with tribal leaders in Afghanistan, uh, men, tunics, headdress, uh, long beards, long beards, uh, some Tajiks, some Uzbeks. And one of these gentlemen said to me, uh, you know, Mr. Gedman, we're quite a religious people. We pray five times a day. And then he smiled and said, but I have to admit to you, many of us adjust our prayer schedules so that we do not miss important programming on Radio Azadi. Uh, Steve, it's hard to do show and tell in such a, uh, uh, a talk like this, but uh, the Library of Congress just concluded a three-month exhibit 
of, I think, 20,000 pieces from our collection of, of uh, mail. I'd gone over to the library uh, to meet with Jim Billington, uh, the Librarian of Congress, to pitch the idea. And his first reaction was, fan letters, why, Jeff Gebman, why are you coming to me to talk about an exhibit at the Library of Congress of fan letters? Uh, but when I showed him these bags of mail, many of them come in scrolls, by the way. I think the longest, the record is 140 feet long. Smaller ones are 20 and 30 feet long. Some are simply letters like these. See what I have here that I could hold up and show you. They come adorned with art. Uh, they come with poems and music requests. Uh, sometimes there will be a scribe in a village who sits and, and kind of opens his space so that people, someone's going to tell me I have it upside down and you'll be right. Um, a scribe will let people come during the course of a day and week, and they'll come and say, well, we want to give our messages to Radio Azadi. I'll hold this back so you can see. Um, hundreds of them, scrolls, et cetera, et cetera. And as I said, it's journalism, but it's a kind of dance or, or love affair with the Afghan people. I think it uh, uh, speaks to the quality of the people who are listening, this great population, and the quality of journalism we're doing. I've got two impressions. That's what we do. That's what I did. That's whom I met with. I have two impressions about the scene on the ground. Impression number one, uh, Robert Gates, Secretary Gates, was right. 2009 in January, I think it was before the, uh, I believe it was before the Armed Services Committee said, if we're going to succeed in this region and these countries and in the war zone, Afghanistan, we need focused, limited goals, and it will be, quote, a hard, or rather, a long slog, he said, close quote. Well, you know, you know this, I think. You, there, there's rich expertise in this room. But you go, and you touch it, and you taste, and you feel it. And Steve, you've been there. You, Afghanistan, let's start there, is a poor, illiterate country, which is badly broken. I mean, I think in Washington, D.C., and Americans just have to come to terms with that. It was 30 years of what? Occupation, civil war, Taliban rule that has simply and utterly devastated the place and its people. I think when you visit, uh, you get a, a painful reminder of reality and the limits and the need for this kind of focus uh, to achieve these goals and, and to succeed. But if I may say, um, you, you experience hope wherever you go. You do experience hope wherever you go. I mentioned this friend of mine, Mike Bora, who runs the U.S. Uh, Air Force training program for the Afghan Air Force. Well, he's dealing with an Afghan Air Force that has about 80 percent illiteracy which has tremendous consequences for everything, starting with training and, and maintenance manuals. And when you see what the U.S. Air Force is doing, it's brilliant and inspiring. And you see the colleagueship with Afghan colleagues, it's brilliant and inspiring. And when you see what they're doing in these education programs, you know, one of the, the Afghan, or rather one of the Air Force uh, officers said to me, by God, take an Afghan colleague and give him a chance, and he jumps. They enroll them in these literacy programs. You know what these Afghan colleagues do? They put pens in their pockets as a source of pride and energy and eagerness to learn and benefit from this experience. It's a long slog, but there's hope. More about that in a moment. Pakistan, obviously, experts in the room, colleagues from the room who come from Pakistan, it's quite different. But in many ways, I think the challenges are no less daunting. 170 million people in a nuclear weapons state with weak civilian institutions, I would say an all-powerful military still, like Afghanistan, pervasive problems with corruption, like Afghanistan, pervasive problems with uh, poverty and a variety of social ills, and like Afghanistan, a serious problem with terrorism, a serious threat of terrorism. As you know, uh, this all-powerful military that I mentioned is an essential part of the solution, but remains a critical part of the problem. If I could commend to you, there's a uh, uh, 
a relatively new paper from LSE. The author's name is M Matt uh, Waldman, um, a terrific piece on the relationship between the Pakistani military and its intelligence services, the ISI, and the Taliban. Uh, this is a gentleman who uh, took several months, Steve, interviewed nine uh, Taliban commanders in the field, a range of Taliban officials, doesn't reach any grand conclusions, but reaches the, 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 the obvious conclusion that this problem that did exist still exists. That is, in a word, that uh, a Pakistani military, which in the past saw supporting extremist groups as useful in its conflict with India over Kashmir, or its proxy play in Afghanistan to retain influence or pursue influence as a check against Indian power has found that the problem is out of control or that the virus has spread or that you can't feed it without seeing that it comes back to bite you. I think that uh, to revisit what Secretary Gates said in 2009, uh, this is all a way of saying if we're going to accomplish war aims, which I, I understand by the last administration and the current administration, is principally and primarily to deny safe havens for terrorists who can strike us and our allies in Afghanistan and to keep Pakistan, this nuclear state, Pakistan stable, that we have to be sober, we have to be realistic, we have to have patience, it will be a hard slog. Impression number one. Impression number two, I'm going to stay with Bob Gates for a second. I think he was right in another respect. Bob Gates said that if we're going to be successful, we cannot seek to impose or pursue or achieve, I think as he put it, a kind of Central Asian Valhalla, right? Now, you know what that means. Uh, I'm not sure I know what that means. I think I, I used to study German, I think, and music. I think that... Uh, it was in Wagner's Das Rheingold that the gods uh, uh, enter Valhalla, right? And I think in Scandinavian mythology, this is this golden and gorgeous majestic hall. Well, I think Gates is right, and I think anybody who has a, a realistic and sober view of the realities on the ground, the complexities on the ground in these two countries, know that it cannot be an aim to uh, bring us or anybody to Valhalla. However, and this is my however, it's a very big caveat for me, I'm quite convinced uh, through my colleagues and my uh, modest uh, uh, expertise and my visits uh, that there is a constituency in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, a quite decent constituency for moderate political thought, for pluralism, and a system and political culture that not only allows for but promotes and defends tolerance. And it's my view that the United States ought to do everything it can to support these tendencies. First of all, I believe it's in our long-term interests, but I also think it's in our short-term interests. Because if the goal or the war aim in Afghanistan is to defeat or at least adequately emasculate the Taliban and other like-minded extremists, we'll never do so without credibility and support from the local populations. Uh, I'm indebted to a, a colleague of mine uh, uh, named Abu Bakr, a, a dear Pakistani colleague, who brought uh, to my attention a terrifically interesting statement by a leading Pashtun cleric, quite recent statement, where this Pashtun cleric says, just a few years ago, it was, quote, a sin to criticize the Taliban. And then he continues, now most people just quietly wait for their demise, close quote. Uh, in Islamabad, I met with a religious leader, a prominent one, who was problematic from a number of perspectives for the United States. Uh, I would call him anti-American and, and strongly and robustly. Uh, he certainly doesn't want a secular democracy in Pakistan. He wants a religious country and a religious state to some extent but not the vicious and not the barbarian version promoted by the Taliban, who he now rejects and he calls terrorist. I think you could go through a number of uh, examples that mirror this in Afghanistan. Uh, people who are religious, people who are traditional, people who are religious and not secular, people who have sharp policy differences from the United States but advocate 
sharp break from Taliban and a different sort of system and rule which preaches and promotes much greater tolerance and much greater pluralism. At a meeting with a leading imam in Kabul, a cleric who I would say was about 50 years old, um, I would say austere is probably not the right word, but reserved. And again, I think, Steve, you and I might find a number of areas of disagreement with him on a number of questions or analyses about U.S. policy or, or the state of global affairs, uh, fiercely anti-Taliban, and said something that I thought was quite inspiring. He said, uh, you know, you Americans, I know you're a great power. You have interests. Pursue them. But I ask you, please, do not forget about the needs and the worthy goals of the Afghan people. I thought that was an eminently reasonable and decent and honorable and fair thing to say. Brings me to the, a, a quick parenthetical uh, remark about General Crystal and his resignation, uh, his blunder and his resignation. Uh, Tom Ricks, I think, wrote in Foreign Policy this week that one should not lament uh, the idea that now that McChrystal is gone, we've lost his link to Karzai. Maybe and fair enough, but I think we should lament McChrystal's well-developed and very conscientious link to the Afghan people, and I think that's important, not only because it's honorable, but because, again, as I say, if we want to win this war, however we define winning, you have to have large segments of the population with us, trusting us, and staying with us during this different pe period. Finally, I say, <clears throat> no Valhalla, fair enough, Secretary Gates, but yes, in parallel to these war aims of defeating the Taliban and like-minded extremists, or, or properly, adequately uh, emasculating them, there has to be a robust, complementary strategy that supports civil society, that supports pluralism, that supports tolerance. I like the word freedom, and I like the word democracy. But I realize that times change. I realize that with different groups in Washington, they have different meanings. I also realize that they have different resonance in different countries at different times. But I think however you define this, I think it's an admirable goal, admirable goal and it is in our interest. Like the hard power war, to make advance and, and progress in this area, there is no straight line of progress and no even chart that we're going to, even course that we're going to chart how do you do it? We can talk about it uh, in the discussion round. Obviously, it's things that are being done, can be complemented, should be augmented. It's broadcasting. It's the good programs that the U.S. State Department embassies are doing in journalist training. It's the uh, terrific work by a number of NGOs. It's engagement. It's rhetoric. It's certainly patience. But I also think it's clarity in Washington and maturity in Washington to know that to achieve hard power aims, it takes patience. It's a long slog. But to do this uh, other kind of work, the supportive and complementary work, is a hard slog too. Um, I think at the end of the day, one of the impressions, Steve, that I walked away with from Afghanistan was <clears throat> time and again, tribal leader, religious leader, parliamentarian, secularist, religious, um, two governors I had a, a nice dinner with, uh, there is a feeling that if we leave prematurely, what we have achieved or what we are achieving will collapse. And the other consensus view, I think, was uh, take us serious as, seriously as a people. We're not merely a platform for your so-called war on terrorism. And if we do it, and we do it in the right way, and we do it consistently, and we do it over time, I think we're going to have very serious allies. I'll stop with that, and very eager to hear the discussion around and your questions and comments. Terrific. Jeff, thank you so much. That was a, a fascinating survey of, of your trips and perspectives and just what a hard slog uh, this situation is. Let me, let me um, just reinforce something and, and maybe ask you to, to go a little bit further, and I'd like to open the floor for discussion. I, I had mentioned to you when we were discussing sort of political Islam and its factions that, that uh, I was in Doha recently. And at this meeting, there happened to be two former directors of ISI. One was a rather, I don't want to go into who they were, but one was a rather gross, uh, flamboyant, uh, deeply anti-American 
person who did it with such uh, relish uh, that, it, that, it, that it really uh, set me off. The other was a much, much more circumspect, much more cautious person who, who looked at the questions and the factions of the American presidents and how this needed to be managed. But he told me, in his own view, something that, that replicated. He says, I know these generals in, in Pakistan. General Kayani was a, was a student of his. Uh, and he said, I know that throughout uh, the ISI that they, there are too many of them who cannot suppress their enthusiasm for the Taliban. And it was just a stark comment from someone who had none of the flamboyance and, is, and, and whose niece works here in Washington and is not anti-American. And so it does raise these fundamental questions as we sit over here, sometimes trying to, like we used to in the Soviet days with criminology, sort of looking at everything, that, that I, don't, I, don't, I worry a lot in these kind of neat and clean binary reads of the ISI and where Pakistan is going that I don't see, it's one of my big differences with my colleague Steve Call, I don't see a or formula in which Pakistan uh, really divorces itself from the Taliban. And I'm wondering if you have any further insights on that. Well, your colleague Steve Cole is one of the, the great experts on this. Um, Steve, um, yes, I, I would agree with you, but I, I think what you argue also makes sense to a large extent. Um, institutions have cultures, right? And companies have cultures, offices have cultures. Uh, but institutions, and certainly big, important, powerful institutions have cultures for a variety of reasons, habits, values, behaviors. And, and even if it's true, I believe it true, that there are signs that key members of this institution in Pakistan have realized that feeding, supporting, tacitly, directly, actively supporting terrorism is a problem. And uh, it has uh, uh, dangerous consequences and dangerous unintended consequences. Even if that's so, A, it's not a monolith, as you su su suggested, and B, to change the culture or the habit or, or, or behaviors of such institutions takes a very long time. So I personally, I wouldn't look for a formula and I wouldn't look for a, 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 a switch that will be flipped, or a moment this year, or next year, or the year after, where we can say, "Ah, we crossed it." You know, I, I think I think it is probably like any of our institutions, our offices, uh, far more complex. And, and as I said, you know, I, I, this is one of these. Uh, it's tedious to say this in such an important conversation, but um, I, I gather in management theory, when when they're looking at corporations, they they tell CEOs, "You can change policies." But the culture of the company always follows much later. Even if you do, you have different meetings and you have different manuals and you replace some people as division heads, the actual culture of the company takes longer to change. I should add before I go to the audience that General Kayani um, sat on this stage, in fact, and did go through and show slides. And he says one of the things he often does, even with his own command staff, is remind them of the three stars, the stu two stars, the one star generals, and many others at other levels that have been killed by the Pakistani Taliban. And so to, to, you know, to continue to reinforce that point about what the challenge is. So it is, it is very interesting. But let me open the floor. I saw a hand over here. Comments? Yes, ma'am. We'll get you a microphone. Hi, my name is Ravia Chowdhury. Um, I just returned from Pakistan on a month-long trip um, uh, focused on U.S.-Pakistan public diplomacy efforts. Um, you talked about the religious cleric who was anti-American. I don't know if you noticed while you were there, if you picked up on this, I certainly did, that anti-Americanism is not just in the <laughs> religious clerics. It's very widespread. It's very prevalent, even amongst the elites. And one of the reasons I would argue is not the religion as much of a problem, but it's the lack of communication between the two countries. And voice of America, though a very noble, independent um, ch um, show, does not reach to the type of audiences that it should be reaching to. And even if it does, it's seen as kind of a, first of all, the name, Voice of America. And secondly, as like a kind of a propaganda kind of a show that's really seen uh, with much suspicion. I would ask the question, how is Radio Liberty bridging the gap between the two nations? First of all, is it in Urdu? <coughs> is it in the languages that is spoken by the people? Does it involve the local uh, locals in a way that they would actually understand it and would be, okay, this is a uh, kind of a conversation between the two countries and not just, hey, this is the U.S. and this is what we're doing? Yes. Um, it's a very good question. Now, now first of all, um, 
uh, Voice of America in Pakistan is locally branded too, uh, at least in the Pashtun region, it's called Radio Diwa, and they broadcast in Urdu, and we don't. We concentrate on that Pashtun region. Look, f- first of all, let, let's concede for Voice of America and for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and anything that's sponsored by American money, let alone uh, American congressional money, for those in the know, it will be a warning label. I mean, why not? I was in uh, uh, Uzbekistan uh, a year and a half ago, had a uh, uh, meeting with a group of young people, and uh, they claimed, they were flattering me, I suppose, they claimed to be enthusiastic listeners of our, our station there, and they smiled and giggled over a couple of things. And I said, what are you smiling about? And they said, well, I teased it out, but they finally said, well, we all think you're CIA radio, you know. And I said, well, you know, we're not, but, but, but if you think that, why are you listening? And they said, well, what you do is pretty reliable, and second of all, uh, it's an alternative, okay? Now, uh, Uzbekistan is a very difficult dictatorship. If you look at Freedom House, they get rankings akin to North Korea. Pakistan is not that way. In Pakistan, while there is self-censorship and lines that can't be crossed, on a variety of areas, certainly in religion. We've talked about that, Steve, military. It has pretty robust, freewheeling media environment with those caveats. And uh, to answer your question, the, the larger question, um, I think there's a, a Supreme Court justice who once said that light and transparency was the great disinfectant. Well, well media is the great disinfectant if it's media which is responsible and reliable and professional. And I think countries like this sound a little bit patronizing, but they need a lot more than Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Radio Diwa, and uh, Radio Marchand. They need a lot more. They need uh, a better journalistic standards. They need uh, a, a better debate about accuracy and reliability. You know, there are a lot of countries in the world that still, you know, want, run wild with conspiracy theories. The, the 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 need to check facts independently and verify things it it's it's different and it takes time. By the way, not to say that there is not good solid indigenous media. What do we do? You said, what do we do to bridge gaps? Well, we try, and I think Voice of America does too. Uh, we try uh, to be very participatory. We try to offer platforms in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We have call-in shows. We have roundtables. Uh, it, it tries to be interactive as possible, inclusive as possible, and, and again, be a service and platform for people there. It's not imposing or not dictating, but you're right. There are warning labels. It's sponsored by the U.S. Congress. That's a problem. And you're right, or I'm saying, you're suggesting it's not nearly enough. The more media in Pakistan that can be truly independent, professional, accurate, and reliable, the healthier the discourse becomes. It has a cleansing effect. But can we're I just not ask enough. before we uh, – we'll, we'll go over here next, but do you read the – do you go and listen to the programs or, or read the reports? You know, I do, and, and, and it's one of the odd things. I don't think anyone in the U.S. government, either in the Bush administration or the Obama administration, would accuse me of being a flack for either one. I read them. I go on Al Hura television. I go on these various things, and I'm always amazed – by the willingness of those programmers, despite my own you know, toxic edges sometimes, to bring in a multiple set of voices. And when you read the, the, the press in some of these other nations, there is none of that diversity. So I, I have to say that's why I'm very proud to have Jeff Gedman and others here doing this, because I think anyone that wants to say this is propaganda, fine. If propaganda is demonstrating that you're going to encourage a civil discourse and demonstrate that it's better to debate each other than kill each other, it's yeah. fine with me. But by the yeah, way, so. and I, I appreciate what Steve said, I, I like your question. I'm not defensive. He's not defensive yeah, either. But, but you know, don't forget that the people working for us, with all the limitations of U.S.-funded broadcasting, they come from these countries. You know, they're, they're not Martians and they're not Americans. You know, they, they are honorable colleagues who choose this kind of work usually or often because they think we're offering the best framework for what Steve just described. But, but yes, it's not enough. It's not enough. Right here. And if I don't see you in the back, it's just because I'm blinded. But uh, just holler. I miss you. Yes. Uh, hi. My name is Saad Mazhar, and I'm associated with Center for Study of Presidency and Congress. Uh, I hail from uh, Rawalpindi in Pakistan, and like uh, I've just come to the United States for my grad study. So I just wanted to make a small comment uh, 
uh, with regards to your debate and your interesting speeches was quite insightful to say the least and uh, i mean uh, i just wanted to uh, make a small comment on uh, like how you describe the history of taliban and like how they have like emerged as a menace to the country and like to the region in j- as a whole uh, i just wanted to say that uh, and, and you have also talked about uh, like C- continuous engagement and cooperation of united states in that region for a sustained uh, stability in that region uh, as a person who has grown up in that uh, country over the years uh, i have taken this impression and i like uh, i speak for like some of the people who have from that country uh, there is a sense of isolation and uh, there there was a very strong sense of isolation when the cold war ended i mean uh for those of you who have watched uh, charlie wilson's war would agree with me that uh, when I, when the cold war ended uh, united states just uh, went off uh, from afghanistan it was that time when these armed groups became taliban ran havoc and like uh, some of them went to kashmir and like uh, started operations over there and like god knows what it it was that time when uh, the operation was ended in afghanistan and pakistan Uh, and, and all these taliban like went to india and like to some parts of pakistan as well and like pakistan found itself isolated at that time had international co- cooperation continued at that time this thing would have been nipped in the bud at that moment and this thing should not happen at this moment because like it has been 8 or 9 years now and if that behavior were to be repeated again it would be the same thing again i mean these armed groups were formed as a part of an international uh, coalition attempts in the cold war and i mean when it has been left alone no one country could uh, deal it with uh, on its own it has to be a sustained international effort a joint sustained international effort uh, to end this menace and it's like not a problem for one in a country or individual it's like a joint problem that we have to address Thank you very much. Well, well thank you. I'll, I'll react briefly. I th- appreciate the comment. And, and as, as we see, we're, we're um, thinking in very similar ways. I mean, it's a big trick and challenge for us Americans, right? B- because um, there are limits to our resources, okay? And uh, we can't be every place, every time, and do everything. Uh, I'm not an elected politician. I, I have a luxury of, of opining here before you. I don't have to go back and, and uh, uh, meet the needs of my constituents. But there are a lot of Americans who are far more interested in health care debate and roads and schools, and understandably so. I mean, th- that's, that's a democracy. I frame it. And now I agree with you. <laughs> um, if you're a serious nation and a superpower... And, and I know we're the latter, and I hope we're the former. And uh, we have a stake, an interest, in, in countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, and, and I think sometimes we, we overlook, sorry, I think we sometimes overlook in Washington. These are not just problems to be fixed and then to be exited. These are peoples <laughs> with rich traditions and, and, and cultures and uh, and national sentiment. Um, I made this comment before. You know, I quite understand why an Afghan colleague will say to me, we're not just a platform for a war on terror. We have a history before, and we're going to have a history after. So somehow we've got to get the balance right, as I said, not everywhere, every place, every time with limitless resources. But, but if we're serious and we identify an interest, okay, and it's constant with our values that's quite important to me then you have to be serious and not be obsessed with exit strategy but focused on success strategy however you define that and that's a collaborative enterprise with you colleagues friends thank you yes mitzi we're fine we'll i'm mitzi worth i'm with the naval postgraduate school i want to ask about words um, i think until the president spoke at west point the words that kept coming out were about victory and success or well no victory and winning mm-hmm. i don't think we've really experienced that since 1945 so i think the choice of these words turns out to be really a problem the same way with the war on drugs the war on terrorism it doesn't really describe 
kind of the end point that we want to get to. And so I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, what are the words you use? Because whenever you call it a war, you expect to have somebody who is defeated and somebody who wins. And in fact, we need to find some kind of, I would call, sensible collaborative end point where you can have a stable, sustainable community where they can take care of themselves. Right. And, right. and, and one doesn't hear that often in terms of the end point. Well, it's, it's a very insightful comment. And um, uh, langu generally, you know, politicians have a little different take on this, but generally serious language is something that evolves. It's not something that's manufactured. Serious language, that's what you're talking about. It evolves. It reflects thinking. It reflects realities. And it's quite organic. That's the way serious language works. And if you step back, you're quite right. <clears throat> you know, 60 years ago, we fought a war, and we won, and they lost, and we imposed, and it took root in Germany and Japan. And the notion that under today's circumstances in Afghanistan, they will lose, we will win, we will impose, and what we wish will flourish is not appropriate, and it's simply not applicable for, for all the reasons you know, a thousand reasons. Um, Language is important for there, and it is for here, and that's a bind for any uh, U.S. president, I think, because be it Bush or Obama or the next president, there's a domestic constituency that wants to hear certain things on their terms in certain ways, right? We're a democracy. So, you know, if my father in North Carolina is listening to President Obama, he, he's listening for something that resonates with him not someone in northern Kabul, with due respect. It has to meet and, and connect with him. Um, the trouble is when President Obama speaks, or whatever president is, even when they focus on a domestic speech, it's heard by, it's an international speech, per definition. I don't know what the language is. I, I, I think the goal should be, and then you can help me think of what the language would be, um, I believe, uh, the goal should be first in Afghanistan, as we went in, and as President Obama and President Bush, I think, actually agree, to deny safe havens to international terrorists who can attack us and our allies. Now, it's like insurance for cars and houses and, and other things. It's not a picture-perfect thing we're going to achieve. It's a probability thing. We, we want to achieve that in such a way that we radically reduce the probability that people can strike us from this territory, but we're not going to reduce the possibility. Not, not in this decade, not in the next decade. The second thing is, on, on my uh, appeal to you to think about this complementary effort to promote, defend uh, civic values and tolerance and, and, and pluralism on Afghan terms and on Pakistani terms, okay? They may be expressed in tribal regions uh, in different ways than we would express them. It's still decent, accountable government. And it's still representative government. It, it, it's still that sort of thing. That's what's critical. I think that in those areas, um, we have to listen carefully to the people whose society it is for language. Because if we can slap on labels, if we're going there to talk about that, but, but Jeff Gedman going to Kabul to talk about the freedom agenda, uh, I haven't the foggiest idea how that's received, but probably not well. By the way, as an aside, Steve, you know, I'm working for a company that broadcasts in 28 languages, underscoring your point, how, value, how terribly important language is. I give a quarterly town hall meeting discussions with my staff and colleagues, 18 bureaus, 550 people in Prague where we're headquartered. Um, it, it may be 550 a, people in Prague. We have 550 people in Prague. Um, we're reaching 25 million people in 20 countries. You know, it's a full-service media company. But I got to tell you, you know, trite observation, me, Jeff Gedman, dumb American. But, but you know, when I give a speech for my company, it, it, it's, not, it's not IBM. Uh, that is to say, I think I can be very careful, very precise, and bell clear in what I want to articulate. But I tell you, my Uzbek colleagues, or my Turkmen colleagues, or my Russian colleagues, or my Iraqi colleagues, or my Iranian colleagues, when they break up from the room and go off to the coffee machines, they interpret what I said in very different ways sometimes. And why not? Interesting. Fascinating. Uh, this gentleman right here, and then we'll go here. No, no, the, the one in the white shirt. And then we'll come up. Uh, my name is uh, Khawar Rizvi. I'm a journalist. Uh, my question is about uh, uh, these two organizations. Radio Liberty and uh, Voice of America, both. 
these are operations uh, funded by uh, taxpayers in the United States. And uh, going out and telling others about their realities uh, is, is a great job if it's done with uh, uh, professional uh, honesty. But what I see here in the United States, uh, you know, these taxpayers uh, really deserve uh, where this money is going and what you are producing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these broadcasts are not uh, open for American air. And uh, knowledge about those areas uh, and information coming down here in the United States through whatever the media size is not enough. And uh, if I compare Geo TV in Pakistan and Fox TV in the United States, I don't see much difference. So uh, professional uh, uh, input is great, but uh, it is not available for American people who definitely need to know what is happening in that part of the world. So are you doing any efforts to win Congress support, uh, to let American people get educated, those are not enough. Thank you, interesting question. Well, I think you have a comment too, you're chomping at the bit. Nice. But, but um, I, I'll tell you. Just, uh, for, I, just to jump on, when you go spend some time with, <laughs> with, with all due respect to my friends in the American Congress on both sides of the aisle, we're not talking about grassroots, which is not my thing. I deal with the 5,000 people who run D.C. And the level of unintentioned ignorance about the issues is, is a real problem. So anyway. Yeah. Uh, well, I think um, that that was harsh, Steve. <laughs> I think that was um, harsh. However, you know. My favorite Jeff Gedman line of all time is I'm going to overstate for effect. <laughs> yeah, well, well I, I didn't say you overstated for effect. I said that was... Well, that I am was, overstating that for was effect. Searing. But, but, however, to, to you know, connect you to this gentleman ask a fine question, um, I think Americans are, are pretty darn sincere and pretty darn open-minded and uh, intellectually curious in general. Okay. Now we've got a history and culture. We're you know we don't border with nine countries. We border with two, and and you know all these reasons that that make us a bit insular and a bit provincial. Okay. See, I'm being more elegant. I'm saving you from yourself here. A bit more provincial, but I think there's a market actually for what you just suggested. And uh, wh what do we do? Well, we broadcast in 28 languages, none of them English, but we do have an English language website, so now you're streaming this, and I can say www.referl.org, or just Google Radio Free Europe. We'll link it later. Thank you. Say hi um, to the viewers uh, of the Washington Note. So, we, <laughs> so hi, viewers of the Washington Note. But, but we, we like to think that that can be a resource. This is one small thing, I understand, but that can be a resource because the content is fueled by all our Kyrgyz colleagues and our Afghan colleagues and our Russian colleagues and Iranian colleagues and so forth, and, and they have a wealth of knowledge. If I may boast, Steve, again, you, you know, w what media company, you know, I've got 40 Afghan colleagues in Prague and full and part-time, 100 in Afghanistan, in Kabul, and covering 34 provinces. And they're native, and they're local, and they speak Dari and Pashto, and they're connected to the communities. I mean, look, the Taliban calls us not to knock us off the air, but to demand time on the air. We had a journalist kidnapped last year, and the Taliban ran in trouble because they were keeping him in a village. And when the villagers noted that they kidnapped this journalist, they said, well, who is he? Where is he from? And the Taliban said, Radio Azadi. All the villagers said, you have to let him go. That's our guy. That's our station. So your larger point, um, we should do more. Uh, for us U.S. broadcasters, there's an old piece of legislation called Smith-Munt. I'm not an expert, but, but it uh, does not allow us legally to take taxpayer money to broadcast to foreign countries and then turn that back to the United States. By the way, call your congressman, tell him it's a bad idea, we've got to kill that law. That, that's what you can do. But, but your general point is well taken. I'm not going to be as mean as Steve is because I'm a kinder, gentler sort of guy. <laughs> but but, but uh, I think Americans are sincere and curious, but, but you have to make the stuff available. And your comment, I won't get into Fox, some of my best friends watch and work for Fox, but, but the, the quality 
of American television journalism, and in some areas, print journalism, is really not what it should be. It's really, the, the standards and the quality is really not what it should be. Okay. I couldn't agree with Jeff Moore, and I should probably <laughs> wind down my comments a little bit, because I certainly wasn't talking about the broad public. But I, I do think that what you said is um, a very important snapshot. But let me also say that I don't think there's a government fix to this, and one of the reasons why uh, I'm a blogger or why I look at Washington for those people who critique Washington, I say, listen, this is a free trade zone for people to pursue ideas and policies. It's it's open. Come and compete. Go Go and try and... Uh, seduce Congress or the media or others to sort of pay attention to things differently. And because I think the media has become so homogenized and because, you know, look, for the last two days I've been on air almost nonstop talking about Stanley McChrystal. Why? Because it finally was the only thing that, that broke us away from the Gulf oil disaster. There is a tendency for so many, you know, I, I do a lot on Japan and China and Korea. Try to talk about those. This is before we get into the complexities of the, you know, mafia gangs running Kandahar. But, but the world is a complex and big place, and, it's, and I don't believe in sort of command economy approaches in trying to deliver that. My point about congressional ignorance, I was just with nine congressmen in the Middle East. These were very good people, uh, really reaching out and trying to learn. But these were people, very powerful congressmen who've been there for a long time, who've been making decisions on spending and the deployment of, of, of American men and women, um, of dealing with various nuanced debates for a long time. And I found myself, uh, and, I f and a number of them from, from states neighboring the state uh, where Jeff's father lives, have a problem with their communities. And they said, you know, I can't go to my community and actually talk about some of what I've learned. That is disturbed. So there were two elements that I found myself disturbed by. One was they really did experience some new things that we helped arrange for them. That, that changed their mental frame. But look, we're still the tip of the iceberg of what of, of any, I'm, I'm ignorant of lots of things in the area. But then the next part was the um, inability as they saw it to figure out how to frame what they were experiencing and learning in a way that would be productive and constructive for their constituents. And I don't know what the fix is, but I do think that greater disaggregation of single large media portals in which we have other informed things. And it, to a certain degree, it's happening. I mean, to be honest, what's happening in alternative media. Um, and I think the Radio for Europe's uh, material online is terrific. And I will, in fact, uh, check with Ari and others in the back on what I can do to uh, ratchet up some yeah. pressure uh, to, to create this. But I don't think there's a fix. So I wanted to deal with your question seriously and not be so, so flamboyant myself, but right here. Uh, hi, Samira Daniels. Um, I uh, was wondering in the in the programming in, Af in Af Afghanistan and in Pakistan, do you see any intellectuals emerging uh, that you know have that kind of? Uh, th this is my concern because I think uh, you know I didn't know, for example, that the CIA existed <laughs> till I was you know way past fifty, really. I thought I was on a Hollywood set or something. <laughs> And, and, and you the didn't point. Know the CIA existed? Not really. I don't think so. I just okay, never. Well, get okay, so, the so, so here's the point. I, 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 know, I know you don't believe it, but I swear to God that's the truth. Oh, you just truth. created. Yes. Well, <laughs> the point that I'm trying to raise is that I see part of the problem as this culture that is this in whole intelligence world in different parts of the world. And mm -hmm. it's the different culture than a non intelligence world, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, to me, it's so stark and so palpable, you know, the, diff, the, so, so, uh, okay, we're, we're so, gonna the, end there. so, the, so the question is mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the antidote to a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, the ISI, is, you know, the emergence of intellectuals that have, you know, and I, wondered if your programming is picking that up or not. Well, I mean, to, to the first thing, um, you know, I do have to either concede or remind you that the company I lead, which it's 60th anniversary, by the way, RFERL, uh, which was established in 1950, was originally established, by the way, by the CIA. And it was secret funding, came out later, controversy, now we're openly funded. It, it was a great idea. I don't know why it needed to be done secretly. I don't know the, the full context, but it was a, a great idea and it deserves to be done publicly and openly. Um, I don't know specifically, although I do know that, let's just stay with Afghanistan and Radio Azadi, 
Um, we do a lot of roundtables and a lot of call-in shows and a lot of guest experts, uh, religious experts, actually, frequently. You know, people will call in, and, and I think this happens with Michal too, Steve. Um, simple, decent people will call into a talk show where we have a religious expert, and they'll want to know if it's an obligation, if they're a good Muslim, to pursue jihad, not in the variety of meanings or broadest sense, but to kill Americans and others. And and it's a, a fascinating, useful conversation to have from religious, credibly religious authorities to say, you can be a good Muslim without doing these things. And in fact, doing these things does not make you a good Muslim. So, so we do engage intelligentsia, so-called, and they do participate, and they do guide these discussions for us. In many cases, it's, it's not us, so to speak. It's us creating a platform for them and their voices. So thank you. I think in the few minutes we have, we're going to collect a couple of questions, and then, and then we'll give Jeff an opportunity to wrap. This gentleman right here, and then right in the back. Mohammed Atif with VOA, uh, here in Washington. Both organizations. Was I nice to VOA? I said very good things about Voice of America, right? <laughs> I, I, I okay. accept. Collegial. We have it on tape. Right? Now, I, I admit uh, all the comments with open heart, uh, <laughs> and there are some restrictions on VOA. I can't do anything about it. I would not comment about it either. Uh, my question is about the goal of both organizations. It's mutual. We've been projecting the good things that the United States um, has been doing, has done in the past, and plans to do in both countries, in uh, economic uh, and social and education sectors. When you go to these countries, I think masses would like to send their children over to the United States for education, for living, or for getting a good job. But when it comes to uh, you know, their opinion about the United States and the United States, uh, is it, uh, I mean, the, the, the United States is not a uh, familiar, uh, not familiar, but a popular country in terms of uh, Muslim world relations with the United States. So how, how, how do we counter that? What is needed that would bring the masses to the other side of the line? I mean, what is keeping them to the other side? Okay, great. This lady right back here. Um, I I have a question from somebody who's following us on Twitter and oh terrific you're live blogging this yes Excellent. and the the question is is there a strategic plan to increase listenership in the mountainous um, backcountry regions of Afghanistan and I had a question as well um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, your trip to Pakistan and um, some comments you had in your World Affairs Journal article on um, anti-Americanism in the military. Terrific. Uh, and, then, and then right here, and then we'll finish up. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, how does the Internet operation fit in with all the other things you do? Thank you. Um, Jeff? Bob, I'll take last first. Um, we're a full-service multimedia company. All our, our services for all our countries have full, robust Internet operations, which means radio on the Internet and video on the Internet and all the other things. So it's, and it's, as you know, it's like everywhere. It's become essential and integral. Now, it is true, market to market, things are different. We're pragmatic. I mean, the Iranians are big, is a big, Iran is a big blogger nation. Afghanistan still is a big radio nation, not only or exclusively, but that, that's the, the basic answer to your question. Uh, the gentleman from VOA, well, I mean, that's, that's not a topic for a seminar or a conference. That's a topic for, you know, a deep American debate about our relations with the Muslim world. I, uh, I don't think that we have to be popular, you know, to achieve our objectives as a country um, I don't think that I need to walk into a cafe or a university office and have people love me. Uh, I think that uh, um, we Americans like to be loved, but superpowers have a very difficult task in accomplishing a very difficult set of goals. Uh, we will sometimes uh, quite inappropriately uh, have double standards and be hypocritical. We should be called out for that. And then other times we're going to have double standards because it's a very complex world. So first of all, I don't think we have to be popular per se. Um, like it, 
compared to the alternative, but I don't think we have to be. And secondly, you know, for anybody who, who is both a patriotic American and travels abroad, it's always eye-opening to see that uh, not everybody wants to be us. It's kind of funny. They have their own cultures and their own languages and their own literatures and their own identity, which brings me to this other uh, point, which we can't delve into too too deeply right now. Um, uh, uh, America's conversation with the Muslim world, and I, I use that expression advisedly because there is no one monolithic Muslim world, and, and UAE is not Turkey, and in Turkey, Istanbul is not Eastern Turkey, and, and Pakistan is not Iraq, I mean, God, and Sunni and Shia, um, but I use it advisedly. This conversation, th- this conversation that we want to deepen and, and mature over years really needs a lot of listening. Not in the sense that we don't stand for our values and and stand for our principles. I'm not advocating any kind of moral relativism. The stoning of women is utterly unacceptable, period. I can think of a lot of other things that are utterly unacceptable. But it does require listening and engaging, Steve, our conversation earlier today, engaging that part of the Muslim world which is neither sympathetic of al-Qaeda, for example, nor perfectly Western, liberal, secular, and pro-American either. And that large middle of many countries is, is complex, is contradictory, is, is troublesome, but very authentic. So that's, that's an imperfect you know, take or, or attempt at your question. The last one, there were two parts. One was um, mountainous regions. Mountainous regions. Um, was that from Twitter? Yes. Okay. I have a feeling that was one of my colleagues, and it was a setup, and here's why. <laughs> we have a strategy. I'm so glad you asked. We have a strategy. Um, when I was in Afghanistan and met with uh, uh, General Bora, the U.S. Uh, commander of Air Force there, uh, who was also quite taken by our radio Azadi, uh, he said, man, how can we help? How can we get more people connected to you in places where people go in and out by donkey? Okay? He said, we fly there. Is that any use? And so my colleague Diane Zeleny said, well, General, we've got an idea. So, Steve, may I get across here for a moment? Leave the stage with the camera and tell you. You see, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a former – it was a great – I didn't set it up, but I appreciate whoever asked he the was question. Prepared. I was prepared. Uh, former high school teacher, you always have audiovisual aids. Um, I couldn't get this out of the box. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but all I can tell you is, we, here we go, here we go. We, we've got right now, I think, about 20,000 radios really cool, by the way. like this that wow. will be branded with Radio Azadi and put in sacks aboard U.S. aircraft and taken to these little villages in mountainous regions. And I think people will absolutely eat it up. I think it's beautiful. Can I see this? Well, well it's, there's a hand crank and uh, a solar, solar capacity, panel. and it will be... There's a solar panel here. Meeting right, if my team needs. is listening, I want a picture of this. This is one of the coolest things. I would want one of these. Well, I, I would go and hang out in the mountainous region if I could get one of those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there was one more. There was an- another part of that. What was it? Oh, I just had a question about your World Affairs Journal article on um, anti-Americanism in the military that you saw. Um, well, you know, I, I, I didn't see it. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I wrote about this. You know, I heard no, – no, look, I told you I'm no great expert. I'm, I'm there for a week talking to a lot of people good range of people. But, um, you know, anti-Americanism is a problem in many places of the world, and it's certainly a problem in Pakistan, and it's not only in the military. And I had been told by a number of people that parts of the Pakistani, parts of the Pakistani military were feeling almost gleeful over the imminent defeat of America and Afghanistan. Now, why is that? Well, maybe it's just gratuitous, visceral anti-Americanism in part, probably is. And also, we get our comeuppance. By the way, this is our neighborhood, not yours. And you came in with hubris, and you thought you would fix these things. It's not so easy. Maybe it's because they think we're going to leave, and they're going to stay. And I guess they are going to stay, and I guess we may leave, which troubles me. So I think it's an element, and it's a problem. Excellent. Uh, 
a very good friend of mine whom I've had here frequently, um, Jim Glassman, who used to be Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and is now the director of the George W. Bush Institute, um, had a great line in which he said, my role in thinking about these various functions and the, and the toolkit we have with public diplomacy is not to make the world like us. I found it so much better uh, than either uh, uh, Karen Hughes and, 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 and others who had held this job because I think they did want to try and create that, that momentum. He said, that's not our job. Our job is to try to get uh, implanted notions, whether you can use uh, methods of public diplomacy to get people talking to one another, listening to one another, getting, you know, not just screaming more loudly what they think, but actually engaging in a thoughtful process that may lead to nonviolent collisions of ideas or collisions of perspective. And uh, I really think that Jeff Gedman captures this. I know a number of members of his team, and I'm so impressed uh, with what they do. And I'm very pleased uh, to, to have the streaming online and have all you uh, here with today. So uh, please give a round of applause to Jeff Gedman. Thank you so much for joining us.